Hey everyone, today I'm going to be showing you some minimal surfaces. And I'm going to be talking about how these minimal surfaces and the equations that describe them have helped pave the way for quantum mechanics and even the description of black holes. What I have here is three minimal surface eggs. And before you can really appreciate what this means, I have to describe what a minimal surface is. Now if you look at these, compared to a normal egg, these look like they actually have more surface area than a regular egg. So why is it that these would be called minimal surface eggs? Well, to understand this, we have to look at some soap bubbles. As you know, when you blow a bubble, once it's completely formed, it makes a perfect sphere in the air. And the reason it makes this perfect sphere is because a sphere has the least surface area for a given volume. But here's the thing, even though a soap bubble minimizes its surface area for a given volume, it still isn't a minimal surface. That's because the air pressure inside the bubble keeps the bubble from collapsing, but the bubble is actually trying to collapse down to a plane. So for a given defined boundary, the simplest minimal surface you can have is a flat plane. You can see when I dip this disc in soapy water, it forms a completely flat plane on the surface of it. That's because this is the area of the least energy. If there were any bumps or valleys on that plane, it wouldn't have the minimal surface area. So it tries to minimize that by flattening everything out. If you perturb it and blow on it, you can get it to locally deform, but as soon as you stop, it goes back to the flat plane. So the flat plane is the simplest minimal area you can have. But what about some non-obvious ones? Well, it took some digging mathematically, but after the 18th century, two other minimal surface areas were known, the catenoid and the helicoid. You can get a catenoid to form when you just take two rings and then get their surfaces to touch. So I'm just gonna blow them together. And then the other one is a helicoid. So I just have a wire wrapped around this stick here. It's coiled around it like this. <laughs> Look how cool that is. So it forms this helical bubble around it. So now we get back to my minimal surface eggs here. So why is it that they look like they have so much surface area when they're actually minimal surfaces? Well, finally, let me tell you the full definition of what a minimal surface is. What a minimal surface actually is, is first you have to have a surface. So I'm gonna say this bag here is my surface. And if you take that surface and define any boundary on it, meaning if you draw any closed loop on it in any shape, I could draw a triangle, a square, or just some weird circle thing on it. If I enclose any area on it like this, the minimal surface would be the area in this circle here that has the least surface area. So for example, right now with this boundary that I drew here, this is the minimal surface area because we know that it would make a flat plane if I were to dip this shape in bubbles. If I bend it up like this, we know that this is no longer a minimal surface area because if this were a bubble film, it would kind of bow up in the middle here, kind of like a taco shape. For example, let's check if a cylinder like this soda can has a minimal surface area. So first we have to define a boundary. So let's define a boundary. So we just have to do a closed loop around it. So I made a closed loop around it like this. You can see this blue loop on there. So all I need to do is get a wire frame like this and let's shape it around the can. Here's my wire loop shaped like the can now. And now let's dip this in soap. And you can see that it's not quite in that same cylindrical shape. You can see that in the center, it kind of dips in like a Pringles chip or something. So this is a minimal surface, but the skin of the can in this bounded area is not a minimal surface. So what you do is to check if something is a minimal surface, you just draw a closed loop on that object and then make a wire frame that has that same shape and then dip it in a soap film and you'll see if it matches that shape or not, then it's a minimal surface. So it's kind of cool that nature does the math for us here. It would require some really complex math to figure out what the minimal surface is, but we can just use soap bubbles to figure it out instead. And that's the cool thing about nature is it always does the calculations exactly perfect. This finally brings me back to my minimal surface eggs here. In order to prove that these are minimal surfaces, what I can do is just bend this wire frame around anywhere on these shapes and then dip it in a bubble solution 
and how the bubble film forms on there should match this shape exactly. But another caveat is you have to make sure that your wire frame that you use doesn't miss out on local maximums or minimums here. For example, on my can here, if I had something sticking out of the center here that my loop couldn't see, then basically my loop wouldn't even know that's there and it wouldn't make the correct minimal surface. So your loop can't skip around local maximums and minimums. So the smaller your loop is, the better it is. So if I bend this small metal wire loop to match the contours of the shape anywhere on it, the soap film should match the shape exactly. What's cool is you can see the strength of this surface tension trying to minimize the energy when you just put a string on a soap film. When there's soap film on both sides, the pressures equal out and there's not one side pulling harder than the other. But if you pop the soap film in the middle of the string, then the outside pulls on it more than the inside and it pulls it into a perfect circle. If you get two loops on your string, it makes it two perfect circles. And when you get 3D objects, it's a little harder to predict what the minimal surface would be. For example, here's a cube that we dip in a soap film. What would you predict? Would it just be eight surfaces on the sides of the cube that'll have flat planes on there? Or will it be something different? Well, let's dip it in and see what happens. Look at that. <laughs> There's a square in the middle of it. So it doesn't just want to form a surface on each of the faces of the cube here, but it actually wants to combine together and form a little square in the middle there. So actually, in order to minimize the area of this, you can see on each face of the cube, there's four surfaces that connect to the inner square in there. So surprisingly enough, minimal surfaces don't actually mean that they have a small surface area. A good comparison to why a minimal surface can have a large surface area is when you compare it to walking around the earth. For example, we know that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So let's say I start here and I want to get about three feet behind me. Well, I can walk in a straight line and go this way. And eventually I walk around the entire earth and I come back to this point. So I went a really long distance taking a straight line, which is the shortest distance between two points, but it took me a really long distance to get to this point. So I didn't go the shortest path. The shortest path would have just been to turn around and walk this way. But the way in which I got there, the straight line was the same in both directions. So in a local area, I was taking the shortest distance to the next point. And that's the same thing with a minimal surface. A minimal surface means that on any local area, the area that's defined in there is the minimum surface area possible. And if you're mathematically inclined to know what the definition of a minimal surface is, a minimal surface means that the curvature of any point on it is always zero. So that means for a minimal surface, the second derivative of the curve is always zero. It's not until recently that we started to be able to describe these minimal surfaces more fully. Because these minimal surfaces can represent the lowest energy state, it can be used in physics. For example, these minimal surface equations were used by Erwin Schrödinger in 1926 to describe the quantum state of real physical systems. And because the apparent horizon of black holes are always minimal surfaces, minimal surface math has been used to describe black holes. And thanks again for watching another episode of The Action Lab. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did and you haven't subscribed yet, consider subscribing. And you can also hit the bell and turn on your YouTube notifications to be notified when I release my latest video. And check out theactionlab.com to see the Action Lab experiment boxes and check out the experiment book on Amazon as well. And thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.